Good afternoon. Will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Cloud is underway. Thank Back you. up is rolling. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Veterans. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chaim Deitch, uh, Chair of the Committee on Veterans at the New York City Council. Uh, my colleagues and I are gathered here today for fiscal 2022 pre uh, preliminary budget hearing for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. This committee will be reviewing the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan and the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's, mayor's management report, PMMR for DVS. In doing so, we hope to have a meaningful discussion about how the COVID-19 pandemic continues to shape DVS's operation and ability to serve veterans and their families across the city. The current status of, and the need for greater accountability and the oversight of, the agency's contracts and the role of Thrive NYC as it relates to DVS's mental health programming. The expense budget for DVS totals 6.1 million in fiscal year 2021 and 6.2 million in fiscal 2022. As of the city's prelim preliminary plan, approximately one half of the agency's budget is comprised of central administration costs with another one third of budgeted agency spending allocated across community outreach, homelessness prevention, and Vet Connect NYC. The city continues to grapple with the fiscal consequences of the decrease in economic activity associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, the preliminary plan denotes $115,227 in savings at DVS in fiscal 2021. Compared to the November plan from the city's hiring and attrition management program, wherein the city budgets a headcount reduction of five at the agency and approximately 5,000 across agencies. The fiscal 2021 PMMR captures significant declines in number of veterans and the families receiving assistance from DVS to access available resources by 69%. The number of veterans receiving homelessness prevention assistance from DVS by 24%. And the number of veterans from whom housing was secured through the agency's veteran peer coordinator, also known as VPC program, 58% between the first four months of fiscal 2021 and the comparable period last year. This is a reminder of the challenges that COVID-19 presents with regard to the agency's operations and again underscores the importance today of better understanding the agency's efforts to emerge from and adapt to and learn from the programmatic impacts of the pandemic. I look forward to the discussion today and I want to thank my colleagues on this committee, the Department for Veteran Services, Council Legislative Staff, Bianca Vitali, Thomas Nett, Nate, Council Finance uh, Division, John Russell and John Chang, and my Citywide Veterans Director, Joe Bello, as well as the members of the public for appearing this afternoon to testify. As we all know, we're still going through very difficult times. So I just wanna take another moment to really thank uh, those who are there, our veterans each and every day. I wanna thank our commissioner, the staff of DVS, all the advocates for your ongoing efforts but to, uh, for assisting our veterans here in New York City. At this time, I will turn over uh, to the moderator to administer the oath. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Thomas Nath, and I am the policy analyst to the Committee on Veterans for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, and you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone who is testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. 
At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify after the oath. Testimony will be provided by James Hendon, Commissioner of DBS, and the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Cassandra Alvarez, Associate Commissioner for Public-Private Partnerships, and Kwame Francis, Chief of Staff. I will now administer the oath. I will call on you each individually for a response. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hendon? I do. Associate Commissioner Alvarez? If we could unmute uh, Associate Commissioner Alvarez, please. I do. Thank you. Chief of Staff Francis? I do. Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Deutsch, uh, committee members and advocates. Uh, as New York City appears to enter the tail end of this pandemic, I urge our constituency to stay safe, wear a mask and get vaccinated if you are eligible and have not yet done so. My name is James Hendon and I am proud to serve as the commissioner for the New York City Department of Veterans Services, or DVS. Uh, I'm joined by Kwame Francis, our chief of staff, and Cassandra Alvarez, our Associate Commissioner for Policy and Strategic Partnerships. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to testify about our budget, Vet Connect NYC, housing and agency uh, pandemic related programs. Following my testimony, I welcome any questions that you may have. Each new fiscal year presents the opportunity to take stock of how, we've, how far we've come, examine the city's resources and make decisions that ensure that we can continue delivering the support that our approximately 200,000 veterans and their families have come to rely on. We are confident that the upcoming budget discussions will translate into a sound financial plan that will enable DVS and the city of New York to provide our veterans with the necessary services they require, further cementing our position as a national model for how to best locally serve those who have defended our country and protected the freedoms that we enjoy. Since our last budget hearing, much has changed. Despite this, our agency, like the people we serve, persevere. Last year, DVS was actively working to fill our nine remaining vacancies, reaching an authorized strength of 49 employees with a projected budget of $6.1 million. Now, our agency is al allocated for a lesser headcount, but an, increased, an increase in our budget by approximately $247,000. Regardless of these changes, DVS stands committed to improving on the success of our unique programs and services while increasing our outreach to more veterans in the city to better inform them of who we are and how to best access our services and benefits. As I said last year during this time, we commit ourselves to work smarter by effectively managing resources, staff, and time to deliver verifiable evidence-based outcomes. The updates I intend to provide within this hearing stand as a testament to that. During our last hearing, we spoke about the Vet Connect NYC transition into an in-house platform. In transitioning this platform, we carefully weighed the concerns and issues raised by nonprofit partners, the council, and constituents, while maintaining the quality of services veterans have become familiar with. In September of 2019, DVS began to track, annotate, and evaluate the growing concerns identified by our constituency. While constituents were overwhelmingly happy with the services provided, Similar themes continue to emerge regarding room for improvement. One common thing was accessibility. While constituents were grateful for the platform and its wide range of services, we found that some service providers were no longer taking on additional clients, which resulted in service delays. In some circumstances, providers, due to various reasons, were unable to take on additional clients for an undisclosed time, thereby confusing our constituents and delaying services. Despite this, DVS continued to triage the platform, ensuring that a reasonable and satisfactory alternative was available to our constituency's benefit. Since transitioning this program in-house, DVS has expanded the number of unique service providers and can more greatly monitor active providers' status. Also, while the number of service requests continues to improve, the price was grow a growing concern. 
first highlighted by a nonprofit partner in 2019 and later amplified by other groups, the Vet Connect NYC price of $514,000 seemed disproportionate to the number of service requests resolved within a given year. This message throughout the years only resonated more as our city entered a pandemic. Moving forward, DVS can maintain the platform at a fraction of the cost. Lastly, a concern raised by the council was DVS's accessibility and maintenance of the data. Now, DVS can better maintain constituent data, highlight applicable services, and most importantly, gather the insight necessary as we move into our new chapter as an agency. As I stated when I first came into this role, a goal of mine is to get hands-on with our people. Through this transition, we're closer to that goal. Moving into this new chapter, DVS has trained, equipped, and empowered several staff members to independently and efficiently manage the Care Coordination Center. In a few short months, DVS hit the ground running. Since October 1st, 2020, we've resolved over 524 individual service episodes in areas such as housing and shelter, benefit navigation, mental health, and education. Further, through this transition, we've significantly increased our number of service providers to 115, 14 of which are mental health and support organizations. As we continue this journey, we look forward to maintaining the care and attentiveness veterans have come to expect when using the Vet Connect NYC platform. Housing homeless veterans is one of the foundational pillars of this agency. Even during the pandemic, which DVS understands has created greater housing and security, DVS continues to actively house homeless veterans to ensure that they are in safe, secure housing. While our veteran peer coordinators are no longer working in city shelters, they continue their important work to house veterans, albeit under different circumstances. For example, house viewings and interviews were shifted to virtual modes, videos of available units were shared, and management companies opted to complete phone or video call interviews with potential veteran applicants. If virtual options, if virtual options were not sufficient, our veteran peer coordinators, VPCs, would, ident would safely conduct physical inspections of units, pick up and drop off documentation, and assist with the veterans move. Through these efforts, DVS has found notable success. Since the start of this fiscal year, we've housed over 100 veterans. This past November, DVS staff housed 29 individuals, our second highest monthly amount in the past three years. To achieve this goal, we utilized existing programs such as City FEPS, HUD VASH, and VASH Continuum, providing our constituency with various housing options. Further, we've engaged and communicated with landlords to expand the pool of housing options for our veterans. Take, for example, the story of veteran uh, Jay. Uh, veteran Jay was a Navy veteran referred to DVS's HSS team in August of 2020 for assistance. Uh, veteran Jay was chronically and street homeless, having been on the street from June 2019 until he entered a safe haven location in July of 2020. Uh, veteran Jay had a history of substance abuse in recent remission. Due to veterans, the veterans' needs and history of being in and out of homelessness, an application was submitted for supportive housing unit in the Bronx to support his transition from homelessness to housing. Veteran Jay completed the interviews virtually via Zoom and, enter, and eventually uh, was able to move out in November on his own uh, to his newly furnished studio apartment. The DVS VPC who assisted Veteran Jay visited him a few times afterwards to see how he was adjusting to his move, and he was happy to chat about his apartment while he went about cooking in his own space. He was one of 23 veterans able to move to a unit set aside for disabled homeless veterans through the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative in a brand new building in the Bronx. Or you know, take, for example, the story of Veteran T. Veteran T is a United States Navy veteran that was residing in a shelter in Brooklyn facing a diagnosis of terminal illness when referred to DVS. Since he was eligible for VA medical services, the veteran was encouraged by his assigned VPC to seek enrollment into the HUD-VASH program, which DVS assisted in getting him an appointment. Following the screening, the VPC found out that the veteran was denied by the program, stating he did not have a high enough need for additional support for case management. A after asking the veteran some questions, the VPC realized that the veteran did not see the challenges he faced and refused to admit he needed help, denying that he needed any support, which is exactly what the veteran told the interviewers leading, into his, leading up to his denial. The veteran's medical condition 
was debilitating for him, which impacted many aspects of his life. Through support and advocacy, the VPC guided the veteran into recognizing his needs and counseled him to seek help. The veteran was rescreened for the voucher, and in light of his new insight, he was accepted for the voucher program in July of 2020. The VPC referred him to a studio apartment that offers on-site services and veteran support, which he successfully moved into in October 2020. As we look towards our next chapter, DVS will continue to work smarter, utilizing the number of resources available to New York City veterans such as City FEPS, HUD VASH, and VASH Continuum. Also, DVS will continue to engage and communicate with potential landlords to more effectively house our veterans. There's no question that COVID-19 has impacted both the health and economic well-being of New Yorkers and the community organizations they belong to. Organizations such as the American Legion, veterans of foreign wars, and so many others throughout the years have served as meeting places for veterans, a home away from home, and a shared space to reflect on what it means to serve. To help alleviate some of the financial burden faced by these organizations, DVS launched the VSO microgrant initiative last fall. Through the generous donations of philanthropic funders, 22 different veteran service organizations that had lost rental revenue due to being closed were each awarded a grant of $1,136. While no amount can cover the economic toll this pandemic has had, we are grateful to our partners and the mayor's fund for enabling us to provide a source of support. We were also able to connect 35 more VSOs to Home Depot gift cards to help pay for sanitizing and general improvement expenses, thanks to the generosity of the Home Depot Foundation. We were happy to hear the, that these efforts made a small positive impact difference for our VSOs. Take for example, Post Commander Leon Yasersky of the Staff Sergeant Michael Allis Post in Staten Island, who expressed his gratitude in receiving these funds in a time of need. He wrote, thank you very much for your help and assistance with getting this grant for our post in this time of need. The Aulis Post is named after Staff Sergeant Michael Aulis, a 10th Mountain soldier who gave his life shielding a fellow service member from a suicide bomber while deployed in Afghanistan. Another organization expressed gratitude by sharing that they purchased a toolbox with the gift card a toolbox that will help them maintain a place they call home. As I often say, our goal as an agency is to make one plus one equal three. By assisting this organization with the recent purchase, we did just that. Another important effort has been our face mask distribution. DVS met the need for masks head on by distributing 38,000 face masks to more than 50 different veteran serving organizations, including VA hospitals and vet centers, supportive housing residences and shelters and VSOs. We've even fulfilled requests for masks from individual members of the community who were in need. There's no task too small when it comes to providing help to those who've served. All of this work can be attributed to the power of partnerships. During a time of need and scarce resources, DVS was able to make a difference for our VSOs and members of the community through like-minded partners that share our core values of service. And I'm proud to share that our Mission Vet Check Outreach initiative is still ongoing. Although the height of the pandemic is thankfully behind us, its impacts will be felt for months and years to come. That's why we firmly believe in continuing the effort to make direct contact with our constituents. It is imperative that they know they are not alone and that there are resources available to help. To date, Mission Vet Check has made approximately 28,000 calls to veterans and their families with a 13% engagement rate. This initiative has also connected 869 veterans to information, resources, and services. Mission Vet Check has also recently served as a, as a conduit for vaccine information as our volunteers are equipped with helpful information from both the city and the VA. Thanks to the help of the New York National Guard, more than 12,000 calls were placed during the darkest months of April, May, and June 2020. Starting in July of 2020, New York CARES volunteers began supporting the project, and to date, more than 400 of their volunteers have supported Mission Vet Check. The New York CARES volunteers who support this initiative have been truly incredible. Some have been making calls to our community every week since our partnership launched in July because they realize how much of a difference a simple, supportive phone call can make in someone's life. Over the course of two focus group sessions we recently held, one volunteer expressed how grateful 
the veteran was to hear from someone who was just looking to help. I was praying that someone would reach out to me and your call came just when I needed it, expressed Kai, who has volunteered for the project for the last few months. Another volunteer shared the following with us. Veterans have a unique voice and they need to be heard during this pandemic. I thank New York Cares for creating this opportunity for volunteers to connect veterans with veteran services, especially now with much uncertainty about our public health, our economy, and our determination to achieve racial, social, and economic justice. They have sacrificed and served, and we must do everything we can to give them the support they deserve. We're fortunate to partner with New York Cares and thank their volunteers for enabling us to establish meaningful connections with our veterans. These trusting relationships position us to deliver services that address vital needs such as food, employment, financial, and VA benefits support. We are grateful for the impact they've helped us make to date. One of the most significant concerns facing New Yorkers during the pandemic is food insecurity. To address this need, DVS has partnered with Get Food NYC to ensure that our veteran populations can access all of the avenues through which the city provides food assistance to New Yorkers. To support these efforts, DVS coordinators received training and certification as Get Food authorized enrollers and are assisting veterans in navigating this program's requirements to get food. Veterans can independently or through one of our DVS coordinators submit a food request once every three days or two weeks of recurring orders. Since the start of this program, DVS has assisted 547 individual veterans with gaining access to food. Our work to address food security goes well beyond Get Food NYC. Since the start of the pandemic, DVS has collaborated with HelloFresh to support the state's Nourish New York initiative. Through this collaboration, DVS works with various organizations to distribute 350 to 400 HelloFresh food kits to veteran households per week. Since the program's launch, DVS has delivered 59,533 meal kits to, have, uh, to, to veteran households, 18,000 in this year alone. Further, in addition to the HelloFresh initiative, DVS is also actively engaged with the Bronx Food Initiative to deliver meals to hungry constituents. Through this collaboration, DVS has distributed 22,068 meal boxes to hungry New York veterans and over 4,500 meal boxes this year alone. As we continue developing internal programs and initiatives, DVS looks forward to collaborating with outside organizations to combat food insecurity facing our constituency. As we navigate the challenges presented by the pandemic and beyond, DVS will continue to build out and provide quality services and information to the New York City veteran community. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to any questions you or other committee members may have. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Deutsch. If panelists from the administration would please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Deutsch. Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner, I just wanna uh, thank you um, for sharing those stories of how DVS has touched the lives of our veterans. And usually you're at a hearing and you hear the panel testifying, you don't hear when other agencies come out and giving personal stories of how um, their agencies impacted individuals. So that was a nice touch and, and your personal engagement in individual cases is, um, is really special. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna first uh, speak about, uh, first I wanna um, acknowledge my colleagues who are, uh, who are here, Alika Amp uh, Council Member Alika Amphrey Samuel, whose husband is a veteran I also want to acknowledge uh, Council Member Paul Vallone and Council Member Alan Maisel. Um, so my, my first question is, uh, is DVS in the fiscal year 22 budget, is, is that sufficient to fulfill the agency's responsibilities or do you anticipate additional resources will be needed? And we all know that, um, you know, we had uh, a year long pandemic uh, which probably, um, you know, made changes for probably many agencies in the city of how they would have to work and, and, and see the long-term effect. So do you, do you anticipate uh, a change in the budget uh, in how DBS is working during this pandemic and, 
and uh, how do we look after this budget? Like, what is DBS's role and goals in regards to the pandemic and the budget? Thank you so much for that question, uh, Mr. Chair. Also, I want to acknowledge, you know, Council Members Ampre Samuel, uh, Valone, and myself also for you being with us today. Uh, the first off, just to, to to put on the table, you know, we can always do more with more, just as far as resources go, budget wise. Um, the way I look at it. It's important to note that the birthday of this agency, we turned five years old on April 8th this year. So, um, you know, I always tell folks, give us a birthday gift if you'd like, um, but we're still in our infancy. And so when I look at not just the pandemic, but stepping back from, you know, at 30,000 feet, looking at the evolution, it's always been about setting us up and having the foundation to be what we are ultimately to become. You know, on day one, uh, when it was MOVA, you only had a handful of people. And here we are, we're at, you know, uh, almost, uh, you know, day you know, whatever 15, whatever 365 times five is, you know, a day 2000 or so. And we are uh, you know, still evolving, still growing. I feel as though the pandemic has put us in a place where it very much made us mindful of what the fundamental pillars need to be in this agency going forward. And so, you know, when I think about this from a budgeting perspective, we're we'll constantly talking with OMB about what we need to do to be able to continue to grow in a smart way, not growing in an, un uh, in a, an inefficient way but also thinking about, you know, what are the core pillars for how we can serve our constituents in real time? Always thinking about it in terms of, you know, in the current operations aspect or real time needs that involve typically food, housing, employment, and healthcare with, you know, how do we have a foundation that can account for those areas? And when I think about what's more of a strategic engagement piece of the long-term things that we need to plan on to now, um, especially with partnerships, with, looking at other opportunities beyond just city opportunities and with how to you know, make sure we've got a mechanism that can continue to build the appropriate programs when needed to continue to evolve. So you know, really the best way to put this is we're constantly growing. I think that the pandemic put us in a place where we very much tightened down, okay, we know this is a very important pillar that we need to hold on to and continue to advance in the coming years. And so I just see this as just along a journey for us. Um, you would think, um, you know, on a side note, you would think that at a time when we're going through a pandemic, right, um, people count on us more now, more than ever, like before the pandemic, because it's very difficult to receive services. And I know that the mayor has announced in September uh, about furloughing, I think it was 9,000 employees to save $21 million. And when you when you're taking those people who are supposed to work for the people off the job, right? So you're actually reducing those services of when people could reach out and, and when they need assistance from the people who work for the city of New York. So, you know, we, we, we went through a very difficult time and it's more important now than ever that we are here for um, for the, for, the, for the New Yorkers to, you know, to make sure that when they need services that we're here to take care of them. You know, from, I know that the unemployment was many issues of people getting through to unemployment and they had no place to turn. So the only place they had to turn is to the elected officials or to the employees. And that was also a time when uh, thousands of New York City employees were furloughed. So when you would call up to try to get a hold of someone, I'm sorry, I'm, fur I'm furloughed today. I can't talk to you today. And uh, I think that, you know, yes, we do need to save money, but we also need to make sure that, um, that we are there um, and, and uh, the employees of New York City are there for the, uh, for the people of New York City in the time of need, especially now um, during the pandemic. Now, is there any new initiatives uh, that the department plans to implement uh, to improve operations? Uh, now that we are still working virtually. And we don't know how much longer it's going to be. So is there any, is there any, new, is there any um, future plans how to improve operations? Like you did mention that there's always more we can do. So what is that more that you think that, um, what is your vision of um, there is more that we can do in order to better give, get better give people access to, to resources? And, um, and to reach out to help. When I think about it, it, it's 
being able to have both the COVID changed everything as far as access to resources for people. And I love that we're able to get to, to we can support our constituents remotely, even right now, even through everything that's happened. You know, we're still able to process, you know, ser uh, service connected disability claims for folks. We're still able to, um, you know, get food delivered to people who have that need. We're still able to help our veterans when the shelter system get housed. And I think that when I think about operational, you know, just evolutions, it's maintaining as we return to work, as we come back and we have the in-person presence to maintain what we've done very well on the virtual side too, uh, in addition to virtual outreach. So I just look at it as, you know, merging the pre-COVID performance and execution and commitment to it that was in person with what we've been doing since March of last year, as far as really mastering, being able to do this in a remote way so we can meet our people wherever they are need wise. Uh, Mr. Chair. What is the, how many, how many full-time employees does, uh, does the agency currently employ? Our count, and I can refer to, to Kwame Francis, our chief of staff, get more in the weeds of it. Our authorized strength is 44. Um, we currently have 39 on staff. What is, what is the attrition rates um, for the department as a whole? So you have 39 now out of 44. So is there an attrition rate of like how many people would leave? I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'll start and then I'll pass it over to Kwame to finish on this one. It's, as an agency, we always, we've been growing. So we've been in this position where the authorized strength is higher, but the head count hasn't caught up to the authorized strength yet. And so we were in that spot um, just before the pandemic hit where the authorized strength was at a higher level than what our head count was. And then everything was paused as far as hiring on account of the pandemic. So I just want to put it in that context as far as what's going on. And Kwame, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question. I think, um, you know, I think you hit on it, Commissioner. Um, nothing much further to add except to just to double down on the fact that um, our attrition rate relatively has been stable um, over the course of the year. And so thus, you know, the, our service offerings and programs, everything has been um, relatively stable for the most part. And, you know, we've actually increased a lot of our service offerings and programs over the course of the year, um, you know, ex um, which was, you know, um, needed, you know, because of the landscape of the COVID pandemic. And so um, everything has relatively been stable, no significant changes on that front. Um, I, I want to go into mental health. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to talk about mental health. Um, first of all, when when a veteran reaches out to Vet Connect, when a veteran reaches out to DVS, if they don't receive the services, if they're unhappy with whatever services or those services are not um, taken care of, like sometimes I would get an email more than once from a constituent saying, you know, I have emailed you before and I'm not happy and I'd like to bring this to your attention and then I would get involved and make sure to take, to take care of it. Uh, as best as as you know, as best as I can. Now, if during the pandemic, if a veteran reached out to uh, DVS um, or any provider, would you get feedback of th that information that if a veteran did not um, fully get the resources that they called about and they're, they're still in limbo and they still need to get something done, would you get that feedback? I'm going to start and then I'll pass it over to Associate Commissioner Cass Alvarez on this one. Um, this is one of the key pieces of why we're so happy to have the, the Vet Connect platform in-house as far as the care coordination unit and being effectively like we're that center of gravity for these referrals as they come in. So, you know, anyone who does come through Vet Connect, they ultimately, it's triaged by folks from our care coordination center. And then we determine whom we would revert them to. For instance, there are 14 different mental health care providers on the platform, as an example. Um, between that and the ability to follow up with the, uh, the, the veteran, you know, once they finish, it's we have more data, more access to the data we might not have otherwise had pre-October of 2020, uh, we made this transition. And so it's something where we've got a better handle on if someone has that kind of feedback, the loop is closed directly because it's no longer us receiving this information from another uh, source, but it coming directly through us. But um, I don't know, Cass, if you uh, can add anything to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the question, Mr. Chair, and salutations to the other members of the committee who have joined us today. Um, so the Unite Us platform that our care coordinators use um, has mechanisms built in so that they can um, see feedback from clients and from providers. Um, we also just conduct regular assessments to assess the quality of the services provided um, from our clients. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, us playing the role of care coordination has a huge impact on all of this. We have a direct established line of communication with each of our clients now, a personalized relationship with them. So if there are any issues, our clients are always more than welcome to reach out to our care coordinators who can also troubleshoot. So we have a few lines of feedback where that information can be shared. Have you received like feedback like, over, like throughout the pandemic? Like how many people called um, who were not satisfied, who needed more help, who ran into uh, ob obstacles during during COVID? Um, I, we don't have that information prepared for today, but we can get back to you with with further details about things that might have been brought to our attention. Uh, can you talk about uh, Commission about uh, United NYC? So at first. Um, uh, we uh, the, we had Beth Connect right, and then that was that was changed over. So can you can you talk about the transition of um, what what United NYC is? Yeah. So, um, Mr. Chair, the Vet Connect uh, NYC platform is a you know a, a online one stop location where veterans who have certain needs can reach out and through the technology provided by Unite Us, touch base with DVS and be connected to one of 115 different service providers to help triage whatever their needs are. Um, as of October 1st, it went from a situation where DVS worked with our good friends at IVMF or Institute for Veterans and Military Families and at Northwell Health to manage this platform that Unite Us runs to it being something that is run by DVS. So this came at good savings to the agency. Also, we believe the efficacy, just in this example we just talked about, as far as just data and feedback, was improved by us having that control point there. Um, as far as VetConnect and Unite NYC, so Unite Us, which is, think of them as the, the software, the, the digital platform that allows us to meet our mission digitally with, uh, with folks who reach out to us there. Uh, Unite Us also has a, another platform that was known as Unite NYC, which had an, another group of service providers who were tangential to those whom we had on VetConnect. Once we took over uh, operating the VetConnect contract or the VetConnect platform, we effectively you know, said, okay, well, let's be able to talk with those who are in Unite NYC as well. And Unite Us had no issues with that. And so you see now a situation where we have 115 uh, service providers who are active within this overall platform. And for the veteran, the way that this impacts a veteran who uses it is there are just that many more opportunities for us to get that veteran the appropriate assistance when they reach out. Um, yes. So uh, first, um, so how, how much, what period did uh, DVS monitor the VetConnect um, that the DVS took responsibility for uh, monitoring um, the information? So we took over VetConnect uh, on October 1st. And then we took over the broader version where you had the Unite NYC is effective February 1st. When you say take it over, what do you mean by taking it over? It's being monitored by DVS? That is correct. It's being monitored. So when you go to, if you go to uh, vetconnectnyc.org, uh, also you can go to nyc.gov slash vetconnect. So if you go to nyc.gov slash vetconnect, when you input uh, your inquiry in as far as requesting a need for services, the person on the other end who's going to see that inquiry and triage it is going to be one of us. Uh, prior to October 1st, it was someone from Northwell Health. And what was the cost of the VetConnect? VetConnect, in total, we've spent, we've spent $964,000 on VetConnect in total. And, uh, and when you moved it over to your agency, then what was that cost? Like, what would you estimate that cost to be? So the I mean, cost you, is- You would have to have, you would have to have um, staff from, from DVS to monitor that, right? That is correct. So now we, remember of the pieces of VetConnect before, we still have the, the digital component of it, which is Unite Us. And so we have a contract with them uh, where that is $175,000 per year to be able to license utilizing that software platform. 
And what, and what was the price tag on VetConnect to uh, monitor? You said this is nine hundred and sixty. Price tag, the VetConnect annual price tag was five fourteen per it year. It was five fourteen, and then when you moved it over now to um, United NYC, right? That's correct. Now it's it's so it, it it's still all VetConnect. Uh, it's one seventy five k per year now. Savings over there. Uh, and this um, this was a savings from the from DDS's budget. This right? was this, this situation where the money that was otherwise spent on the larger contract is now spent on a, 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 as a lesser amount as far as for the execution of that Connect NYC. And that was part of the six point two. The agency's um, a budget cost. This was yeah. This was a this was a savings. That's right. This is a six. So specifically, the VetConnect. This came from that. Yes, and this is a savings of sixty-seven percent uh, as far as between what we once paid and what we uh, pay now for VetConnect NYC. And, and what is the um, so how how long has this been part of United NYC? Since uh, this has been uh, since uh, since February first, Mr. Chair, as far as United NYC. February first. How do we know how? Um, how it's being monitored and compare it uh, in comparison to when DVS monitored or when VetConnect monitored. I want to clarify that DVS is always monitoring. It's more so when you think about the United MSC, it's just we have more service providers now. That's the essential change is that there are more service providers whom we can refer our veterans to ultimately. So it's since October 1st, DVS has managed the VetConnect NYC system. And then when you think about that merger with you, the, the United NYC, all it means is that we went from having approximately 80 service providers to 115 service providers. But still the action of who's gonna refer this veteran to this provider, et cetera, that's under the hands of DVS. And, and how, how did it go from 80 providers to 115? So when, um, we, when, it, when we covered yeah. down on the VetConnect platform, they had 80, approximately 80. Once we merge with the Unite NYC platform, that brought the total to 115. So, they, so United NYC had their own providers previously? That's correct. They had, all the, they had their own providers who serve in areas, tangential areas where our veterans have needs. That's right. So it made sense um, um, regarding the savings and also expanding the providers, right? And, and I, I, and I want to, um, that's correct. Uh, there was an additional price placed upon us to expand and have these additional providers. Uh, and just to, to, to clarify, uh, you know, United NYC is the broader NYC network and VetConnect joined that broader network. Think of us as having an insular system with just our 80 service providers before. And once we tapped into United NYC, now there are 115 total providers that we can access and, and uh, put our veterans in touch with. Um. So what is what is in comparison to when VetConnect uh, was the provider and and now United NYC? Um, what is the difference of how many veterans were serviced? Like, what do you see the difference of that? You know, just Probably, good so before question. You had, um, before you had eighty providers, now you have one hundred and fifteen providers. So how do you see how do you see the when you compare it? How do you see the difference of how many people were served by VetConnect? And now, how many people are being served by um, by United NYC? Now that they have, they went from eighty to one hundred and fifteen. A couple, a couple of things I want to I want to add to it's the other piece of it. When we talk about pre and post, the comparison is prior to October first, DVS we didn't run, we weren't behind the scenes as far as running the care coordination. Center. So if someone sent something into the VetConnect website before October 1st, it wasn't a DVS person dealing with it. It was our friends at Northwell before. From October 1st forward, it has been someone at DVS. So when we draw that line in the sand, if you look at the seven months from uh, you know, March to uh, October 1st, so really if we take it from when the, the pandemic first began, you know, say March 17th is when things were declared as far as being the state of emergency. If you go from March 17th to October 1st, you're looking at 414 uh, folks whom we assisted through VetConnect NYC. This is prior to us taking the helm of the vehicle, 414 people. If you count it from October 1st to the present, it's 524 people. And so, you know, we've seen just more efficacy, if you will, since we've had this transition. Or we've seen more utilization is a better word. 
And where did these providers come from? Are they New York City providers? Like, like if you had 80 before from BetConnect and now you're jumping to 115, like, like where were these providers uh, when, when DVS was still with uh, BetConnect? I'm going to refer to Cass to give an answer on that because I know that, that at the end of the day, all of these providers are on the same sheet of music with providing service to New York City constituents who have needs. I can say that but as far as where each one individually is from, I, I can't speak to that at this time. I, I know Cass, can, anything you'd like to add to that? Absolutely. Um, so the providers that were part of the VetConnect NYC network stemmed from the New York Serves uh, model of the program, which was the predecessor for VetConnect NYC and still serves throughout the country as the America Serves Network, which is a veteran specific care coordination network. So that's why VetConnect NYC had access to that grouping of providers. When we broadened the service provider uh, network by um, opening up VetConnect NYC to Unite Us NYC, that's where all of those other providers came from. So they were part of the Unite Us NYC platform um, and they were using that system to service New Yorkers. They, many of them are New York City-based organizations. Uh, many of them are national organizations, have offices in New York City. Um, so that is, that's sort of where that growth came from. These are all still vetted service providers um, that all have um, expertise and training in their respective areas to offer quality services. Uh, we just kind of opened up the channels to enable our veterans to have access to a broader range of different providers, which we think would be really beneficial to the community. And why is it such a... Um like a uh, lot big difference between the vet the price on vet connect and uh and the price on how much united nyc the cost of united nyc is that's that's a huge difference right by having vet connect you said it would cost five hundred fourteen thousand a year i want to uh, um just to, to be clear the the way that vet connect was run before october 1st you had, uh, you know, we we'd contracted the care coordination unit responsibility out effectively. So the overall project management was handled by Institute of Veterans and Military Families, and the care coordination unit was run by Northwell Health. Um, the digital component was Unite Us. Once we got past October 1st, the digital component was all that was left, and we dealt with managing all other pieces of it. And so it's almost like you had this vehicle and we had someone else driving the vehicle up until October 1st. And then we said, okay, look, we'll drive this vehicle. And so a lot of the savings come from us having uh, internalized the care coordination aspect of this. But the, the people in DVS, the staff in DVS who, um, who have oversight this, what, what, like, what positions did they have before that now they have the time to monitor um, United NYC? So we took uh, constituent services staff and have them in this role. And so you had folks who were involved with assisting our veterans already in a different way, who are now kind of behind that, the scenes on that vehicle to make sure that when the requests come in through Vet Connect, things can be triaged appropriately. And like we were already, this is work that we were already doing. It's just now this is an added piece of it, basically. I'll get to my colleagues to ask some questions. I see Council Member Vallone. Has his hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we'll turn over to council member questions at this time. Uh, I will call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question uh, and have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Uh, we're asking the council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin. First, we'll hear from council member Vallone. And begins. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner and your team. Always a pleasure to see you. And honestly, this is our eighth year now. And I thank the council members who are on this committee and the ones that were on the previous committee um, are looking back with pride on how many steps we have taken together from where we were eight years ago to where we are today with our very own DBS and an agency that has grown. And under your stewardship, we're very proud on, on how our veterans now are treated in New York City with respect and dignity, and we thank you for that. Um, it's budget time. So we're, as council members, we're here to, to lobby and advocate for every veteran and, and every dollar we can get. So 
and, and the chair has been going over diligently with that. So, you know, use us for that ability to, to fight for those extra funds of every dollar we can. So, so with that, I think, and you may have started in the beginning and I apologize, do, do we have, because I know the numbers have declined, but do we have a number of the amount of veterans in 2021 that we currently are residing here in New York City? We do. I want to couch this with uh, the most recent, this is based on the most recent uh, ACS, American Community Survey five-year estimate, uh, as far as, and I want to split it as we've done in the past, where there's the veterans that the Census Bureau tracks, and then we have to go to the Department of Defense regularly to get a count of the active duty, the National Guard, the reservists, and something else called a great area retiree. That's someone who's retired from uh, National Guard or Reserve, but haven't begun to withdraw their benefits yet. And so that's a different group that's not accounted for by the Census Bureau. Um, based on the 2019 five-year estimate, there were 150,924 um, veterans, just veteran people no longer serving in any way, shape or form, 150,924 veterans uh, in New York City. And that's ACS uh, 2019 five-year estimate, which was published a few months ago. And now the DOD data, which we last received, the last count we have is as is, is old as 2019. So we're waiting to get new numbers from DOD. Uh, their count is at 58,095 in that other category. That other category is the active duty, it's the National Guard, it's the reservists, and so it's great area retirees who live in the city of New York, uh, you know, council member of alone. Uh, I'm, I'm in this group, I'm a drilling reservist, so I'm not included in the ACS count of 150924. I'm included in the DOD count of 58095. This brings a total count as of today from what we have to 209019 as a, as population number goes, 209019. So Commissioner, is there, and those are all resources provided to you, has there ever been uh, a requirement or something that we, I know we've talked about it. I know we included on the new New York ID to have a, a veteran listed, which wasn't included in the beginning. But I always wanted whether any city agency should, should be given that information from every other city agency. And so many veteran services cross platform with other interagencies, right? So whether it's our seniors with DIFTA, whether it's DHS with homeless, whether it's landlord tenant services, is, is there a, a overall requirement that DBS must be notified of any senior, of any veteran um, that comes to that agency? Like, do you have a complete total of veterans receiving services through city agencies? We don't have the count now, but I'm so proud to, uh, happy to report that uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, the mayor signed an executive order whereby now constituent facing organization, not just DVS, but any uh, city agency that faces constituents is to provide, is to ask a question to affirm veteran identity. In other words, you know, uh, you know, have you served in the US Armed Forces at any point? And so we will start to get that information. This goes back to the narrative you said about where we've come in these past eight years and what it's looking like. So just wanna credit you and other members of the council too for advocating on this. It's something that was just recently- So commissioner, so you're, with that executive order, you're gonna get that data? That's my point. It's like, it's tough to, to advocate and fight for more unless we have that exact number. So you, you've got this omnibus of, of, of city agencies all over the place. And I've always wanted to make sure if I was sitting in your chair, I'd wanna know every veteran that has applied for service within New York City and any agency, besides the total number of agencies of veterans living in the city. So you have two, right? You have total veterans in the city and then you have veterans seeking service. So will that executive order provide you with that confirmation data finally now of how many veterans are actually applying and receiving city services? We, we believe it will. And I want to couple it. And this is why I also like to, you know, just give, uh, you know, the credit to the council also, as we think about the you know uh, local law 23 which also requires data numbers you know uh, for agency functions as pertains to interacting with veterans so we think about this you know uh, between you know the executive order which was recently put out where this question must appear on those constituent facing agencies hey are you or have you ever been a member of the u.s armed forces that piece and then we look at this local law where this type of data must already be gathered um, and we're currently working, you know, agency by agency to get agreements ironed out to be able to collect the data. It's one of those things where it's, uh, you know, we're taking one step at a time towards it, but it's going to the right place and exactly where you want to go and where I want to go on this issue. 
And, and Mr. Chair, the last the last question. I mean, we could take still, your time. You could you could take another few minutes. Yeah, because these are great. Because I mean, we have to starting with that platform, then builds how we can provide services and fight for the budget. So, it's it took some time just to get that. But I mean, if if the executive order, and I'm sure the chair and the other council members, we can put in any bill that would require. I want to make sure you have that data every year, so we can grow with it, especially now post pandemic, right? Because now as we as a city are now transforming into the services we provide to get through the pandemic, post pandemic, and then beyond. And veterans have their own unique needs and demands within that also. So there was the world pre pandemic and now the world we're in now and the budget is flowing around that also. So you mentioned now the combination of the Vet Connect with, the, with our chair and United NC merger and there's over a hundred now nonprofit providers. How, how does, in this grand, I guess, scheme, how does DVS interact with the procurement and the contract process that the nonprofits are either um, submitting the bids for or submitting services for? What is DVS's role in assisting those providers in obtaining contracts and getting the funding? I want to make sure I understand this. Is this about Vet Connect and the service providers on Vet Connect? Well, I mean, either because I mean, it's a, it's a new world now that they've merged. So, how if there's any veteran provider or nonprofit provider and there's a the procurement process what is dvs's role in the procurement process do you have a contracts uh personnel or division or do you assist in any way because navigating that system no matter what agency it is is very difficult to do is dvs part of that i want to um i'm going to defer to cass alvarez associate commissioner for strategic engagement to, to answer a lot of that i want to just start by saying on this issue of, of contracts and helping our nonprofits in general, it is a need in our community that we very much hear and, and we're very much sensitive to as far as what we can, you know, how we can be able to add value there. And that was one of the, the roles that we had been in the process of hiring for right before things froze with the pandemic. So this is something that is, you know, speaking to you as someone who's seen this thing since before there was a DVS, you know, this is still something that is of value to us as far as being able to provide that. And I spoke to long-term what we see the agency looking like and being able to assist our nonprofits in that way is a piece of the puzzle. But I, I want to defer to, to, to Associate Commissioner Alvarez, anything else on, on this area? Yeah, and if there's any extra budget that we need for that, that might be something we could fight for to make sure you have that right staff to do that. Because I think that's an essential component, navigating that, that myriad of obstacles in order to get the funding is, is so difficult. Sorry, Cassandra, I don't know, if, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. Thank you so much, Council Member Vallone. Um, the only thing I'd add to that is that we have an ombudsman who's been assigned in our office to help uh, the veteran service organizations that receive funding through the discretionary uh, contract schedule C um, process. So he makes himself available to um, all of our veteran service organizations should they have any questions about the contracting process or in case they encounter any hiccups, he's there to help them troubleshoot. Uh, he also does proactive outreach to help uh, in those situations. But I'd still like to think, and I think we've spoken of time of that, we, we want to see that position at DBS. And I think the commissioner just said that was pre, was part of the vision before the pandemic and COVID and OMB shut everything down. Do you, do you think we can get that position filled this year? Because I, I would love to be able to hand off and where we're done, say we filled that need um, beyond an ominous button. I think a, a, a dedicated procurement contract staff at DBS would be a huge advantage for folks to navigate. Do you think that could be something done this year, or is that something in the next administration? I like, I'd love to see that done with a with a dedicated staff. You know, um, Councilman, I, I don't want to get ahead of you know uh, talks that we're having with OMB on these types of subjects. Just know that we're very much simpatico on this. I'll say that, and as I mentioned, we were literally going through the interview process right before things you know took a pause. That's good. <laughs> That's um, good news. That's I don't want to. So as you know, we were actively in talks uh, with our you know uh, folks internally on this issue. But just know that it, uh, we recognize how important this is to the community and the longer term piece that this plays in this you know what you've built you and the council and others who are outside of the council have built in creating this agency. We recognize how critical uh, you know, uh, a role this is. And so it is something that's very important to us. I, I can say that. And thank you, Chair, for the extra time. And uh, if, if there's anything else, Commissioner, with this year, really want to thank you, the staff, the chair, and everyone who has created 
something that never existed before. So we're all just trying to make this better each year. I think these are all just pieces to a very large puzzle and you've done the best you can. So if we can help you make that even better to the end of this year, please work with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just want to continue something that uh, Councilman Vallone mentioned in the absence of a contracting officer. Um, Cassandra, Cassandra just mentioned that um, you know DBS is open to the community-based organizations in case they need assistance. Did, did any community-based organizations reach out to DBS that they're having issues? Because I know that all across the city, um, many not-for-profits were having issue with their um, uh, with the contracts. Um. Not not any specific outreach through our ombudsman, um, but we can verify that and get back to you in case there are particular instances. But I can't speak on any at the moment. No. All right, because we we're having um, some not for profits, some community based organizations who are testifying. And I remember the last hearing or two years ago, we we went through the same thing, and we had DYCD at one of the hearings and. They said, oh, yeah, we're taking care of everything. And then when I heard from the community-based organizations, they said, no, we haven't had any outreach and we're still having problems. Um, so, so I think that's very important because it's impressive how many, uh, how many more, um, uh, how many more um, resources that uh, DBS has now um, going from VetConnect, uh, leaving VetConnect. But I, I think it's equally important because you have to know that the initiatives in the city council is almost half, if not half of DBS's total budget, operating budget. So it's so important for these non-for-profits, community-based organizations to go out and do their work and without having the contract and without having uh, it streamlined. Um, you know, we're not even talking about streamlined, we're talking about just getting it done. Right, so it's so important that those not the profits are able to, um, you know, not put a hold on their services because they don't have the funding for it. Mr. Chair, I just want to add, you know, you and the council and the uh, committee members, you you help us by referring folks to us whenever this occurs because I know we've been in the community as we mentioned before we've you know worked distributing micro grants to more than 20 of our VSOs we've got 25 uh, a rolling group of about 25 that we use to help distribute food to our homebound veterans every week and you know we've uh, distributed those 38,000 masks um, you know and so it's a to different VSOs and the Home Depot cards we've got these touches I just I worry that if someone thinks okay I've gotten this money it's council discretionary money so I'm going to go back to council on this, my issues. When people come to you, please let them know they can reach out to us. And they can call us. It's 212-416-5250. They can email us. It's connect at veterans.nyc.gov. You know, they can find us. They can message us on the website, nyc.gov slash vets, even on social media, uh, you know, at NYC Veterans. You know, we run a shop similar to the way you run a shop. And if they reach out, we're going to take care of them. We're going to hear about it. Uh, but we just want to make sure people know they can come to us if they have these types of questions, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah. So it just it's just like if if someone has a if a community based organization <clears throat> has a problem, they have to they call me. I have to I have to call DBS or send an email, whatever the case is. We're going back and forth, we're working with three different people, three different uh, community based organization, the elected office, and uh, and the DBS. So that's why it's always would always be easier to have um, a contracting officer within DBS. This way, they know that. You know, DBS is responsible for that, for that, opposed to going and dealing with five different agencies. I, I don't disagree. Um, I think that during the pandemic, you know, I understand we paused things, but I, 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 I don't disagree. I feel like this is we we're building something here, all of us, and it's important that it have different pieces. We think this is a piece, and you know, I, you know, I hope that we can get to a place where we can have more news on that front. Just know that we're talking internally with uh, folks in the OMB and, and, and just staff wise to see what can be done here. But um, yeah, I don't disagree at all. Um, I wanna talk about um, housing and homelessness. On February 23rd of this year, the mayor announced that his administration has housed approximately 1,000 veterans as part of, of the administration's continuing mission to rehouse veterans who experience homelessness. Now, how many of those of the 1,000 veterans were housed in the past year during the pandemic? 
the it's been since March 18th, 2020, if we take March 17th as the day when you had the uh, state emergency declared, it's uh, 126. And that's um, 126, yep, since March 18th, 2020 to the day, Mr. Chair. And, and when did the mayor announce this um, this plan? I'm sorry, announce which plan? Are you saying when did, is that when did we start the housing or yeah. is it November yeah. 6th, 2015? So before we became an agency, but November 6th, 2015. So when you run the so count. The, so the yeah. 1,000 veterans that were housed, that was from 2015? From November 6th, 2015, yes. November 6th, 2015. I think it's important to note when you look at that, when they first created DVS, I understand we were signed into law in 2015, we actually officially chartered officially on April 8th, 2016. But um, yeah, the first thing that was done was we took bodies from the Department of Homeless Services, combined them with what was then staff at MOVA, and that was the initial piece of what will become this agency. So just want to give that in context and why we kind of credit our first veteran housed from November 2015. What is the estimate of um, or f um, how many homeless veterans are street homeless? Um, and, and also how many are in shelters? How many homeless veterans are, are in shelters? So the count, the 2020 point in time count, this was uh, the count taken on January 28th, uh, 2020. The numbers were just released by HUD uh, this month. Three unsheltered veterans uh, in the city of New York and 685 sheltered in the city of New York. Okay, three unsheltered. Yep. And? And 685 who were sheltered. They're saying there's three, there are three veterans? Living three, street on... home, three street homeless or unsheltered as it's termed. And yeah. then another 685 sheltered. So those who are in the in the shelter system. So do we know why the three who are unsheltered, why they are not in shelter? Like what the reasons are? Um, I can say that we do. I can't say that right now directly. I know that the Department of Homeless Services street homeless team is in touch with these individuals. Um, but prior to this count, it was six who were unsheltered during the 2019 count. And DHS maintains touches with these individuals. Uh, I can't speak to the reasons why, but they've chosen to remain unsheltered. I can say that much for now, Mr. Chair. Do you have anyone on your staff who, who, who works with the homeless that could possibly answer that? Oh, as far as you want, so you want to know exactly why each of these three people is still, is unsheltered. Yeah, is what you're yeah because this is from 2020, right? So you have That's three right. unsheltered. And I, I, want to, I just want to know where they are now. Are they sheltered now? Or they still I, I, want, I want to, first off, we can get back to you with more details on it, but I just want to be clear that these are three who are, first off, this is captioned point in time count. Secondly, the Department of Homeless Services street homeless team has knows who these individuals are and regularly engages them. And these are individuals who've chosen to remain unsheltered. So it's, it's um, yeah, this is uh, something where they've chosen to, to uh, be in that position. We can get more information about it, but yes. Who's and in charge of DHS? Just to, for perspective, who's in who's the who's in charge of DHS? Oh, uh, you, as far as the administrator for the Department of Homeless yeah. Service. Oh, it's jo oh, Jocelyn Carter is the administrator, or the uh, a person who's the administrator for Department of Homeless Services. And he's the liaison to DVS. Oh no, no, that's the person who's the who's my equivalent as an agency head uh, for that that group. I understand. So if you have if you have three unsheltered people on the streets who are veterans and DHS knows who those three people are and regularly checks in on those people. Yeah. So what interaction does DHS have with veterans uh, with DVS to say, OK, we have three unsheltered veterans in the streets and we know what's going on. None of your business. Right, your DVS. I don't. I don't have to tell you. I don't have to give you any information, because we are DHS. But that's unacceptable. No, I want to. I. Uh, so, I, think so I what I want to know. I, I, that's yeah. That's not the situation with DHS. It's not a situation where someone is hoarding information. That, that's not the case no, at all. I know that, but I want to yeah, know. No. But 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 where are those three people now? If this is if this was in 2020, and you have three unsheltered people, like if I had. Um, if I had three unsheltered people in my district that I went to visit and I knew where they are, 
right? Or I knew that the, their house, then I would know what they, I would know that they're right now in housing, not on the street, because I, I, I following up with them and I know where, exactly where they are. If, if DBS is the agency that's taking care of uh, veteran homelessness, and from 2020, you have three unsheltered people. Like, where's the feedback? Like, where are these three people now? We want to know where these three people are. Yeah, now. no, no. We, we get back to you on that, uh, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Um, I, that's no issues. We have you. Know, we maintain robust conversations with the Department of Homeless Services. We can get back to you on uh, with that. Um, so yes. Yeah. No, 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 I know, I'm, Commissioner. I don't have a. I have a question for you. I have a question with DHS. Mm -hmm. Like, why aren't they giving this information? to DBS and saying that we sheltered these three individuals or those three individuals are unsheltered because we all know that DRIVE, NYC, um, is part of the DBS budget, right? So if it's a mental health issue, then DRIVE would step in and work with the three unsheltered people. But DBS should know, they sh DBS should get the information from Thrive NYC or from DBS, where these three people are today. And, and it shouldn't be, I'll get back to you, let me find out. That's not my point. My point is, is that if, we, if we're taking care of our veterans and we're, we're talking about uh, over 200,000 veterans and we try to um, hold accountability to, for every veteran out there, that need services, and we have three unsheltered veterans. So when we're dealing with thousands of people, why can't we, why don't we know where these three unsheltered people are? That's my point. So where is DVS and um, where's DVS and where's Thrive NYC? By getting this information over to DVS, of where these, these three people are. These are three human beings. These are three people who are unsheltered. So I just wanna know, like today we have, you know, we have the budget hearing and we'd like to fight for more resources for DBS, whatever, whatever's needed. And what I'm, what I'm seeing here is that we don't know where the three people are who's, who's been living in the streets since 2020. And that's what disturbs me. We, uh, is, there any, is there any way to find out by calling DBS now or by calling um, Drive NYC, like where these three people are today, like where they are now? Mr. Chair, I, I, first off, I want to say I, I, I hear what your concern is and we'll get to the bottom of it as far as just making sure we can get more information about these three people and making sure they have the appropriate services. I hear what you're saying. You're saying if these people are unsheltered and this is by choice. Are we making sure if there are any mental health issues that those needs are being met? And so I assure you, we'll, we'll go back on that so we can make sure to, to, to just circle back and give you a report in general. Isn't there, isn't there I, 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 I think I'm hearing what you're saying there and that's, we, we can get back to you on that. That's not, this isn't, this is something that can be done. And I, I, I understand, I'm, I, I take the, I, I, I completely take your point, so. Yeah. We keep on putting more resources. We have a pilot program now um, through 911, right? If someone needs mental health, right? There's a pilot for you familiar and, with that. And I'm sorry. And one, I'm sorry. One thing I want to just uh, say too, just this information was published last week as far as the point in time count. And so it's not that like we, you know, I just want to put that out also. And um, we will definitely get back to you as far as uh, working with uh, that street on the scene to get information about those three people. But, um, you know, I just want to put that out there that this is, um, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. And I take your point. I just want to say that. Sorry. Because if you have, I, I just want to continue this just for another few minutes. Yeah. You know, if you have, you have care counselors, right? So if you have three people who are unsheltered living on the street and DVS comes and, and uh, DHS comes back to you and says, listen, we tried everything we need to do. And Thrive NYC comes back to you and tells you we did everything we needed to do. Then at that point, you would probably send out one of your peer coordinators or peer counselors to go out there in the streets, right? Yeah, no, you're you're right. Like I, I that's why I want to I want us to um, do what we need to do here 
and, and get back to you in general. Cause I, I, I take the point completely. I just want to say that. Um, yep. Um, what is the budget of uh, Thrive NYC towards um, in BBS? Um, what is that? Six hundred thousand? About six hundred thousand? I believe so, but I want to I want to defer to uh, Kwame Francis just to get us that 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 answer. Um, Chief Staff. Yep. Thanks, Commissioner. And that's correct, Mr. Chair. It's six hundred thousand. Yeah, thank me for the question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so. Um, throughout this pandemic, what did, um, like, how did Thrive NYC contribute to the mental health of our veterans? Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that, Commissioner. Yeah, okay. um, I think it's important to just uh, point out that, you know, mental health is built into the ethos of what we do at DVS. Um, so programmatically, we know that um, engaging veterans and addressing their basic needs, whether that's housing, food, safety, job loss, transportation even, um, that we're in a better position to, to on-ramp to mental health resources and care through those um, related mental health um, outreach efforts. Um, so through the Thrive DVS partnership model, like we refer individuals that we interact with uh, to social services and mental health resources in the community um, and through using the Vet Connect um, Unitas platform. Um, I think moreover, the advent of mission vet check robustly enhanced our mental health service capabilities. Um, and so I think I'll defer to um, our associate commissioner, Cassandra Alvarez, who can also talk more about, um, about the success of mission vet check in collaboration with Thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kwame. Um, and just to double down, as Kwame said, mental health is part of the ethos of our service delivery at DVS. Um, Chair, Mr. Chair, I know that you are familiar with the Mission Vet Check initiative that we referenced during our last hearing uh, and have been promoting since. Um, that effort continues. Um, Thrive was our very close partner in helping us build out that initiative um, and then managing it in its early phases. Um, and to date, we've worked with uh, a lovely core of New York CARES volunteers that the commissioner also mentioned during his testimony. Um, and they have been uh, very dedicated in uh, calling our constituents on a weekly basis. And thus far, uh, we've placed over 28,000 phone calls to the veteran community. Um, so that's, that's just is another um, illustration of us doubling down to make meaningful connections with our constituents. Uh, Commissioner, I want to go back to the three unsheltered veterans in the street. And <clears throat> I don't know if I could continue without knowing where those three people are. Is there any way possible for someone your staff could call up um, DHS and just to find out where they are? We don't, we'll have somebody work on it right now, Mr. Chair. Yeah, because I, 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 yep. I, I can't end the, hand, the hearing without knowing where these three people are. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to know. I want to know where they are, if they're still out on the streets. And because, you know, also during COVID, you have, you have the different shelters throughout the city. Some shelters have a capacity, let's say, of 150 uh, people. And because of COVID, that number was reduced. So how do we know that there isn't more than three people out there who are unsheltered um, since the beginning of COVID, that people were forced to go out of shelter because of the pandemic and COVID? Uh, it, what's, I think what's complicated about that is we know those who interact with the city in some way, shape or form. Like we know who those veterans are. We, we say that we'll get the information about the three because we can touch base with the DHS and the street homeless team to get that information. So we know that because those people are on the radar for someone who's not. And a whole other issue, I think we brought it up at a past hearing, you have veterans who don't even self-identify, who won't even tell people that they have served. And so we're doing everything we can within the realm of what we can see, um, including things like the executive order we just talked about with Councilmember Vallone, including things like there's this, you know, uh, our own survey that, you know, we've been promoting lately to try to get more veterans to get us info so we know who our people are. But it, there are just some areas where we will not, unfortunately, be able to get it because, you know, if someone does not say that they're a veteran uh, or if someone does not interact with anything that touches the city's 
uh, you know, ecosystem for homeless support, then it may not cross paths with us. We've been trying our best to, to triage this. Another suggestion you gave we've been taking also, Mr. Chair, we've been reaching out actively to community boards throughout the city so that they know whenever they encounter anything or any uh, you know, constituent reaches out that they contact us. Same thing goes for mutual aid groups in the city, making sure they know who we are to contact us. Um, and so we're trying to get to turn the lights on more to see what's in the room, but there's still areas where there's some blind spots. I, I have to say that. Okay, I, I want to get to the I want to get to the advocates. I don't want to, you know. Um, I just want to know this grief, this grief, um, unsheltered veterans. I just want to get an answer to that. If we could get some someone we've to, got, we've, uh, we've got some folks um, reaching out to DHS right now. Um, you know, I don't. I can. We can. We can circle back to you. You know, as soon as we. I, 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 I want. I want. I want the public to know where those three people are. You know, and then we can. I don't, uh, we're we're working on it. Um, yeah. I, I have to say that twenty three people it shouldn't take too long. Working on it. I just we, we're not going to share anybody's personal identifiable information. No, no, no. I just want to know yeah. if they're still in the streets or where they are. Mm -hmm. um, can I just could, could we take like a five minute break? Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, no problem, Mr. Chair. We'll work. Yep. Yeah, thanks.
see anything. All right, Mr. Chair. Yeah, hi. Hi, hey, Commissioner. You know, I, okay, so the um, administrator for uh, DHS just got back to me and they said they yeah, cannot disclose this information in a hearing as far as that's what I'm being told. They cannot disclose it in a hearing. I want to, you know, work to get you as much as we are able to um, be honest with you saying like we, we cannot disclose this in a hearing is, is uh, just so you know, as far as the update on it. I say, um, say what, start, start again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I, I just connected with the, uh, the the administrator for Department of Homeland Services, and she just got back to me saying, hey, we cannot disclose this information in a hearing. She said, I just checked. We cannot disclose this information in a hearing. What information can they disclose? Um, I, information, information about the about these street homeless people, about about these specific about these people, about these street homeless people, as far as disclosing that information. Uh, you know, I had mentioned that. before, too, just about being mindful of personally identifiable info. I'm happy to work with you to get you information. Not, no, 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 Commissioner, I'm not asking them for names and addresses and social security numbers or anything like that. I, I just want to know that um, if these three people are still on the streets, if these three people are still unsheltered, and, um, and what is being done about it? And if Thrive is involved, I'm not asking for personal information. I, I think that- Like, you know, when, when, when I first had, I don't know if you remember, Commissioner, when I first had my first um, veterans hearing in 2017, this administration told me, um, I asked the administration to have my first hearing at the homeless shelter. And they told me that they can't disclose the location of the homeless shelter, so I can't have my, my hearing at the homeless shelter. But then when I Googled, the homeless shelter, the veterans homeless shelter, I found it on Google. And then they agreed to let me have my first hearing at the homeless shelter. So when they're giving information saying that they cannot give me disclosed information, I'm not asking for personal information. I just wanna know what the reasons are why if they're still out on the street and what is being done about it. I I hear exactly where you're coming from. We're trying to, to work to get you. I, I uh, try calling Commissioner. Back. Just to, I feel like, you know, um, us playing operator with DHS in the middle of the hearing, like we can work to get you these this information for you and the council. I just want to, you know, be mindful we're, we're doing what we can to get it. And just for perspective, uh, we're trying to get this number down to zero. It was 450, uh, you know, 10 years ago. So we're working and doing great job here as far as our street homeless veteran population. We're all working, thanks to your support and others in the community to get this number down. And I wanna be able to get you and the council members information on these three. Um, I just, right now, you know, just not able to do it right now in real time, unfortunately. Um, Nicole Branca, she, I mean, she would have had this information. Um, she's been amazing, Nicole. Um, do you have someone that does the housing in DVS? Uh, we, we have someone who does the housing. Um, and what's funny is, you know, I, I, Nicole is amazing. Uh, we will get those responses to you. I just think Nicole, you know, has, has said this same thing as well, as far as, you know, we know who the folks are in the DHS at their street home, you know, how, you know, that homeless team that works with folks. We just need to touch base with them to get the information. Whenever Nicole needed this, because I've asked this of her before, she's no longer here, but when she was, I'd ask it. She said, look, let me, you know, I can reach out to the street homeless team to get this information for you if need be, as far as, so you have it. So we want to do that same thing. It's just to do it in real time like this. We just need time to get that so we can get back to you, Mr. Chair. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and I, why would they tell, Commission, why would they tell you that they cannot give information on a hearing? It's... It's just, I think it's just this, uh, the idea of who, disclosing who, who do you, who do you, information and to-, to no, I'm asking personal. Who, who, do you, who do you speak to in uh, DHS? So I connected with the administrator uh, of DHS, it's Jocelyn Carter. And it's not about, I think it's, they just wanna make sure that anything that is put out is filtered before this is put out in this public form as far as these these details. We just wanna make did, sure did that he, before he, we put everything out there that nothing is said that's, you know, like uh, we, no one wants to misspeak on these types of very sensitive issues. Did he tell you why DVS wasn't informed? I didn't ask. Um, I did not ask why DVS wasn't informed. Um, you know, like, like I said, we we want to, you know, this is what these meetings are for. It's for you to say, hey, look, I need to know certain things. And when we say we will get back to you, 
uh, with that information, recognizing it's not just you, but you represent the public. And so we want to do that in the right way. I'm very much on the same sheet of music with you. Just no, I, I know that, Commissioner. It's not. I, I know that it's not you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not complaining about you. Um, you're doing a great job. But I just want to know why DHS and and uh, and Drive, whatever the issues are with the unsheltered, discreet unsheltered uh, veterans, why doesn't DVS have that information? No one in DVS received that information from these agencies. Um, and and when when it's questioned, when I question with like what's going on with the discreet unsheltered people, no one knows. It's problematic. I think that just to step it back, you know, we talked about a thousand veterans who've been housed through the, uh, you know, through the agency since so November. We deal, yeah, but, the, but we could deal with a thousand. I want to just put a perspective. There've been 3,800 total veterans who've gone through the shelter system since 2016. So we touched a good number of vets, but we don't touch all veterans who go through this system. So when we have situations where that veteran is being engaged by another group, be it a VA affiliated group or the VA director or be it uh, the DH Department of Homeless Services or another entity, you know, we just have to tie in with them to get info. So this isn't, what's happening right now is not a foreign thing. And I wanna get these answers for you. I just wanna be clear that, you know, we do a lot with veterans uh, who have housing needs, but we're not as an agency touching every single veteran who goes through the shelter system. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. But when you have three people who are unsheltered, then that doesn't make sense because three people living on the streets right? When they're living in the street, we need to pay more close attention to those living in the street. And, and that doesn't make sense. Um, whoever's in shelter has shelter over there, has a roof over their head. Whoever's in permanent housing, whoever's in supportive housing has a roof over their head. But when you have three people who are, who are out in the street, then that's problematic when information is not given over to, um, to DBS of who they are and what the issues are. So this way you could have your peer coordinators do outreach and figure out, you know, what more needs to be done. Like we always say, there's always more that needs to be done, but we should have already exhausted all our options. And, um, you know, I would personally go out there if, if I could get that information and to see what more needs to be done. But if we don't get the information from the agencies, then our hands are tied. Right. And, and that's what disturbs me. It was like, why can't we get information e even on real time? You know, they should have this information on their fingertips if they they know with if they know there's three veterans who are unsheltered. They should already have the names since 2020. They should have all the information of how to contact them or where they are or why they refuse shelter. You know, we're fortunate to have very good, um, very good uh, supportive housing in the veteran community. You know, Jericho Project, there's so many good housing, uh, um, supportive housing and uh, permanent housing where, you know, I had the opportunity to visit uh, every one of them in the first three years as chair of the Veterans Committee. And people even called, they want to get into housing in the veterans community. Unfortunately, if you're not a veteran, those shelters are very, the shelters that the city is running now are very problematic because I could say they're unsafe. They don't have the resources needed, but thankfully the veteran supportive housing has those resources. And so it's very limited. There's very limited reasons why a veteran refuses to go into a shelter unless someone is a drug user and um, would rather be on the street because you can't, you know, you can't use drugs in, those, in a shelter. So I want to know what those reasons are, and that's why Thrive uh, needs to get involved in this to, to figure out how we could help those three individuals who are unsheltered living in the street. So, I mean, I'm sure you agree with me that we should get this information real time because they should have this information on their fingertips and not giving me a runaround and saying we cannot, uh, oh, we'll get back to you. I, I know what we get back to you means when it comes to DHS. Um, I could wait till I could wait um, maybe my next lifetime to, to, to get an answer from them. So that's why I don't see a reason why they can't give the information real time. I just tried calling Commissioner Banks twice on the cell phone. Um, he didn't respond to me, but you know, I don't know what to say. Um, this this hearing should have should have ended. And I want to hear from the advocates, but I still want to know where these three people are. Where like. 
what the issues are with these three individuals that I could stop my hearing now and get into my car and run over to that location and see what I can do. And I'm sure, Commissioner, you would do the same because I know you, you would do the same. And you're, you're very hands-on. So what disturbs me is, is how these agencies don't interact and don't tell DVS, don't give DVS the information when it comes to veterans. That's why we have an agency. So I don't know what to say. I really don't know what to say, um, but I, I would still like to get that information. Maybe Cassandra, Cassandra? Cassandra is very competent. She's great. Uh, maybe Cassandra could light the fire and get that information. And we've got folks working on it also right now. We've got folks okay. working All right. on it. I appreciate it. I really appreciate yeah. it. We, we, we understand where we come from too. It's, yeah. it's, I think for us, it's, we, yeah. you know, we trust our agencies. So the, it, it's almost like a military context as far as these are our peers, our, our brothers and sisters to our left and right. And we trust our friends at the Department of Homeland Services. And so we will- I, I don't, that's why I'm questioning. I don't. And, and, uh, and thrive too, as far as just to, what I'm saying is when they tell us, hey, we know who these people are, we're working with them. We, I, we will get you a response to your question. I'm confident we'll be able to get that. So yeah. I don't, I don't trust them. I don't trust the Department of Homeless Services. I, I don't trust them. You, you have too much trust in them, but I don't trust them. And, and I just want to get this information. I just want to know where, if these three people are uh, taken care of, what the situation is, what the reason is why they refuse to go into shelter, and that's it. That's all I want to know. So I'm not asking for the for the, for a name. I'm not asking for the age. I'm not asking for any more information. All I want to know if they're in contact with these three unsheltered veterans, and what are the reasons that they are still out in the street and they refuse shelter. It's a very easy and, and that's it. it. There's no there's no private information there. This is important for a hearing so the public could know um, of what work the DHS is doing with our veteran community. I think it's only fair. No, I understand, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I could try calling Commissioner Banks again. Tova, can you try Banks? Try again. How did that? How did the vaccines going go with veterans, Commissioner? The vaccines. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. I, let me I, let me take this. This is a DHS. Let me take this. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Thank you. 
Miss <laughs> Jack. Goodness, I guess we were both on mute. I couldn't hear that last thing you said you were on yeah. mute. Um, and they're they're you know uh, looking at this right now. I, you know they just said so they call me back. They just called touch base. But yeah. So, so can I, Commissioner, with uh, can I go to uh, um, public testimony and then we'll come back to this once you have the information. Um, not a problem. Thanks so much. Mr. Okay, right. Thank you so much. I want to thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have now concluded administration testimony and we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For council members who have a questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. The first panel will be Coco Culhane, Isabel Mulbauer, and Kathy Kramer. I will now call on Coco Culhane to testify. Time begins. Hi, I'm Coco Culhane. I'm the executive director of VAP, the Veteran Advocacy Project. And I just wanted to comment on the three unsheltered vets, if I may quickly. Um, you know, I think that likely, hopefully those three individuals from a year ago have been sheltered by now, but I think we should all just take a step back and realize that three is an absurd number. Um, I can name, I mean, I won't because of confidentiality, but I could name three of my clients who are unsheltered right now, right? And it's for any number of reasons, um, including, you know, not being afraid of the shelter system and not wanting to be sort of, you know, cattle herded through it. Um, so I just wanted to say that because I, every year when we have these numbers, I find it disturbing because um, I think we all know, as the commissioner said, there are so many vets who don't even identify and, and they're street homeless as well. Um, I agree with you, Coco. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I questioned um, the non-veteran homelessness. I questioned the, the deputy mayor a few, um, last week, and I asked him, give me the reasons why they refuse shelter, and he didn't want to give me any reason. He refused to give me any reason. So, you know, we need to first identify what the reasons are that street homeless, why they don't want to go into shelter, and then then we have to work on these shelters to make sure that they're, they're sufficient for, for, um, for those people. But, but I know that in the veteran community, we have very good supportive housing, right? It's not like uh, we have more resources in a way. So that's what bothers me is when you have a veteran out there, I wanna know what the reasons are because a lot of those reasons, um, I can't think of a reason because we have, like I mentioned, Jericho Project. Looks like a five-star hotel. And veterans call my office because they want to get into some of these supportive housing, uh, veteran supportive housing um, projects. So that's why, that's why it's important for me to know what the reasons are. But if they don't have the answer of why they don't want to go into shelter, then that's problematic. Because otherwise, how are, we going to, how, how are we going to shelter those three individuals? So you're right. When you look at a non-veteran, um, you know, I could tell you six, seven reasons why that individual doesn't want to go into a shelter, right? Because unsafe. I could I could go on and on. But in the veteran community, it's a little different. So that's why we only have three who are unsheltered, and there's a lot of resources that we have, federal resources, city resources, and that's why it's important for us to know what those reasons are. I, I appreciate Coco. Yeah, thank you. No, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to also touch on some of the issues that we're seeing with the pandemic. Um, you know, the usually I'm always uh, beating the drum for less than honorable uh, discharged veterans because they can't access the VA and all of those resources. Um, but now what we're seeing is that all veterans can access. Um, you know, the VA backlog has more than tripled in the last year. Um, they're, you know, with 12 months of regional offices being closed, there's just going to be massive due process violations. And those due process violations are dollars, healthcare, housing subsidies, you know, all of those safety nets that New York's veterans need more than ever with the pandemic um, in particular, because we're seeing, 
you know, the systemic issues like systemic racism, economic injustice, um, you know, all of the things that do get compounded in the military. And then when you come out, um, leading to less than honorable discharges and more criminal justice involvement, things like that, mental health, um, we're just seeing that sort of triple compounded now from the military to the civilian transition to now the pandemic really hitting those um, communities harder than any other New Yorkers. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for the funding that uh, you know, chair and the committee members have secured. It didn't go unnoticed that it was higher. Uh, it was increased in a time when there's a budget crisis. And so just want to thank you and hope that we can continue that support. You know, I think 10 years ago, New York City was not a military town and veterans really only had other veterans to rely on. And now I think we really are a model for the nation um, in terms of collaboration between government, um, different levels of government, different agencies, and the innovative programs that you're funding. And I just think right now we really, uh, it's crucial to not cut back on that funding with this sort of looming crisis in terms of VA benefits, in terms of housing, you know, all of the different things. And finally, one other thing I wanted to touch on is the digital divide. Um, we are, it's, I lose sleep every night over the clients we can't reach. Um, you know, we have clients who don't even have a smartphone. And so we have to do home visits. And if they don't pick up the phone, you know, we joined DBS's uh, vet check effort, which is terrific. But we also know that most of our clients won't answer a phone number they don't recognize. And so there are clients we have not been able to reach for the entirety of the pandemic. Um, and in terms of mental health care, you know, one of my clients said, well, I just couldn't figure out that camera thing. And right there, you know, his mental health is a casualty of the pandemic. He stopped getting treatment. So, um, you know, working to make sure that New York's veterans do have access to, to care through these telehealth would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Isabel Mulbauer. Time begins. Chair Deutsch, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Veterans Committee about the fiscal year 22 budget. My name is Isabel Mulbauer and I'm the senior paralegal in the veterans practice at the New York Legal Assistance Group. I'm joined by my colleague Ryan Foley, the supervising attorney of NILAG's veterans practice who is also on the call. The New York Legal Assistance Group uses the power of the law to help New Yorkers in need combat economic, racial and social injustice. Given the level of need in New York City's diverse veteran population, NILAG operates two veteran-specific legal programs. We have a medical legal partnership with the Bronx and Manhattan VA Medical Centers and a community-based program that provides comprehensive services to veterans and their families, regardless of their discharge status and eligibility to use a VA healthcare system. I have been working with NILAG's Veterans Practice, our community-based team for over five years, serving as a first point of contact for New York City veterans seeking legal assistance. It is an extremely challenging role as I frequently encounter veterans in crisis who are dealing with one of the most stressful and difficult moments of their lives. Many of the veterans we work with struggle with severe mental health issues like PTSD, TBI, and MST, which can complicate their legal issues and needs. Veterans face all the same legal concerns as any other population, but also experience issues unique to their veteran status and military experiences. Our veterans practice focuses on veteran specific legal issues while simultaneously utilizing the expertise of NILEX 300 plus attorneys, paralegals and financial counselors to comprehensively address any other legal needs. Over the past year, which has been especially devastating for the vulnerable veteran community we serve, this, this ability to maximize resources on behalf of New York City veterans has never been more important. NILAG is extremely grateful to the City of New York for its investment in legal services for veterans over the past several years. NILAG has been the recipient of funding through the Legal Services for Veterans Initiative since its inception, and because of that funding, we have been able to assist veterans with thousands of cases in the areas of veterans benefits, public benefits, housing, consumer protection, and advanced planning, among other legal needs. NILAG was awarded and is anticipating funding from the New York City Department of Veterans Services to assist veterans who require discharge upgrades 
due to receiving less than honorable discharges for issues related to their sexual orientation, sexual trauma, or traumatic injury. This new grant is vital for veterans who cannot access benefits due to their less than honorable discharges, benefits that could provide stabilizing income for veterans facing hardships due to the pandemic. Still, services for veterans have not been spared from budget cuts. NILAG's legal services for veterans funding was significantly decreased by 32% in the fiscal year 21 budget, which has impacted the number of veterans we can serve despite the myriad of new obstacles faced by the veteran community because of COVID-19. Every day brings us closer to what we hope will be the end of this devastating right. pandemic. May I have another minute? Every day brings us closer to what we hope will be the end of this devastating pandemic, one that has claimed the lives of over 10,000 veterans. Even as we see positive developments in the fight against COVID-19, we must prepare for the new needs and challenges sure to follow the end of current federal and state COVID-related protections, particularly VA debt relief and New York's eviction moratorium. It is essential that the city council and the administration continue and expand the funding that allows NILAG and other civil legal service providers to help New York City veterans face both the current and impending challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to engaging in further discussions about serving our veteran communities and improving their access to critical legal services and other resources. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. NILAG does amazing work and thank you, Ryan. Thank you for your testimony. We will now call on Kathy Kramer. Uh, Ombre Samuel, Malone, and Maisel. It's, my name is Kathy Kramer, and I am the CEO of Legal Information for Families Today, usually called LIFT. And I'm here to speak to you about LIFT's work with veterans and active military service members in New York City. With our team of lawyers, LIFT is one of the few organizations in New York City that works directly with litigants who come to family court and cannot have a lawyer. Each year there are over 250,000 filings in New York City family court. And in most cases, the litigant does not qualify for a free court appointed lawyer and many cannot afford to hire a lawyer themselves. 80% of litigants who come to family court proceed without a lawyer and they're, they're coming on issues fundamental to the well-being of their children, such as child support, custody, visitation and protection in domestic violence cases. With the support of uh, Chairman Deutsch and the rest of the New York City Council, LIFT has expanded outreach and service to veterans over the past two years. Veterans often face a number of family challenges due to their service and then their ultimate return to civ civilian life. Child support responsibilities do not stop when someone is in active duty and met many veterans look to modify these orders before they leave. It's important that they are aware of these laws so they can protect their legal rights with regard to their family while deployed and once they come home. LIFT offers free legal advice and guidance to them. During the pandemic, a time when the family court services have been greatly limited, LIFT's 100% remote operations have provided essential information and updates on family law. There is a huge demand for our services right now. Our helpline has re received twice the daily number of calls for assistance and our lawyers are doing twice as many legal consultations as in 2019. But the family court is only working on a limited basis. No new child support cases have been heard in the last 12 months, even though thousands of New Yorkers have lost their jobs. There have been no opportunities to modify child support during this time and arrears are accruing. The court is now working on pending cases that were filed before March 2020. The backlog of child support cases will take years and this is a huge problem for all our clients, especially veterans. And in addition, many of our clients do not have access to the technology to participate in family court. Um, the digital divide is hurting people who are struggling with so many challenges. During the past year, we have participated with veteran, veteran working groups and collaborated with these partners remotely. We've worked with about 85 veterans during the past two years of this new program. We've done Know Your Rights presentations um, and legal clinics out in the community, communities re remotely. We've written two legal resource guides for both veterans and active military parents. These um, 
take the complicated legal uh, laws and put them in plain language, and they're translated in eight different languages, and we, we distribute them throughout the city. We have one attorney that now specializes in veterans family law. We're actively working with Fordham School of Law Ferrick Center to develop, develop a presentation on Know Your Rights that their, um, that their volunteers can give to veterans at city universities. We've joined Unite New York City as a provider, as well as working with NILAG, the City Bar um, Justice Center, and other groups. Our work in this area is mainly on child support, but we work with, uh, with veterans on a number of issues. For example, we give a voice to fathers who often feel they've been wrongly painted as deadbeat dads, such as a veteran who had never missed a child support payment, but felt he was not being respected or heard by the court. We helped another veteran who was about to be deployed into active duty, and though he shared le legal and physical custody with the mom, she threatened to withhold visitation when, when he was on leave and move the child out of state. We've connected re veterans to resources to help them find employment and reduce their child support payments through state programs. We've got in a mother who has a um, travel assignment to challenge a child support ordered against her when she missed a hearing that she never received notice of. We've assisted a veteran who owes $350,000 in arrears in three separate child support orders combined. He had been driving buses and working for Uber because he could not walk well due, an in, due, an, due to an injury, but the child support office suspended his license for non-payment of child support, so now he's unemployed. And we've recently advised a veteran who had service-related mental health issues to get, on how to get visitation with his child that he had not seen for months. The mother had an order of protection against him, and without provision regarding visitation, she basically was keeping him from seeing his child. Can I take one more minute? Um, so all of us at Lyft are profoundly grateful to the city council for your ongoing support of Lyft's new programming. Without your core funding, we would be unable to serve the 25,000 New York families in crisis every year. We hope that the council will continue your support of our citywide initiative. And we ask this committee to continue your support of the $60,000 that you've given us and that has been guided through the committee through the chairman. Although the family court is experiencing a difficult period, Lyft is part of the solution for both the litigants and the court. Thank you again for considering our testimony and for ensuring Lyft's future work with veterans. Without you, we could not continue this important work. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. I will now turn it over to Chair Deutsch for any questions. No, no questions. I just want to I just want to tell the panel, the first panel, um, you all do amazing work and. Uh, we're very familiar with all the work you do on behalf of the veterans, and um, just just thank you, thank you to uh, thank you, Kathy, for your testimony. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I will now turn to the second panel. The second panel will be Allison Messina, Joe Vitti, Peter Kempner, and Ashton Stewart. I will now call on Allison Messina. Time begins. Good afternoon, Chair Deitch and fellow city council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Allison Messina. I'm the Vice President of Workforce Development at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services organization. For more than 53 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals who are experiencing homelessness to renew their lives. Each year, Project Renewal serves nearly 15,000 New Yorkers, including hundreds of veterans, through our wraparound services that focus on health, homes, and jobs. We are grateful to Speaker Johnson, Chair Deitch, and the City Council for their generous support of Project Renewal's Homeless Prevention Services for Veterans. To let, today, I'd like to give you an overview of how Project Renewal staff have worked to meet the needs of veterans during this pandemic, while demand for our services has increased. In fiscal year 20, we provided health care, including primary care and mental health services, to 168 veterans through our four clinics located within our shelter sites, as well as through our three mobile health care vans. Despite the challenges in delivering care during the pandemic, we've kept pace with our service delivery this year. Among our housing programs, we welcomed 37 veterans into emergency shelters and 62 veterans into supportive housing. 
And so far in this, this fiscal year, we have ensured 63 veterans are safely housed within Project Renewal, and they're benefiting from our enhanced services, which include telepsychiatry. Our employment services also continue to be critical in helping veterans get back on their feet. So far this year, 20 veterans have enrolled in Project Renewal Employment Services. We expect this number to climb now that our programs are fully operational. These are job training programs with proven track records. Our sector-based training programs have placed 83% of our graduates into jobs over the last five years. Before I conclude, I wanna tell you about Richard, a veteran who lives in Brooklyn. Richard served our country for over a decade in the Marine Corps and the Army National Guard. After his service, Richard had trouble adjusting to civilian life and ended up unemployed. In 2018, he enrolled in our culinary arts training program. And upon graduating, we hired him as a chef at City Beat Kitchens, which is our social purpose enterprise, a catering company, which also prepares meals for shelters across New York City. Today, Richard is a vital member of our team. He helps to prepare 7,500 meals a day for New Yorkers in need. Richard's renewal would not have been possible without the generous generosity of the New York City Council. Your support has been essential for ongoing staff training aimed at better meeting the unique needs of veterans and helping us reach our goal of becoming a preferred veteran service provider citywide. It's also facilitated our partnerships with the VA hospital system and collaboration with other organizations that serve veterans. We're proud to serve those who bravely served our country and sincerely appreciate the uh, consideration of increased support so we may build upon these efforts at a time when our veterans need us most. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Joe Vitti. Time begins. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Deutsch and members of the New York City Council Committee on Veterans. My name is Joe Vitti, and I'm the director of the Hospice Veterans Program for VNSNY. I also served in the Army as a battalion intelligence officer for a field artillery unit in the role of a platoon leader and a fires intelligence officer. I want to take this, op I want to take this opportunity to thank you to, to testify about VNSNY's Hospice Veterans Program, for which we're requesting $150,000 in council funding. Venus and Y is the largest freestanding, not-for-profit home and community-based healthcare organization in the U.S., providing care to more than 44,000 patients. Venus and Y has cared for vulnerable populations continuously and been there for New York throughout the many of its biggest public health and natural emergencies, including COVID-19 since March of last year, where we cared for more than 5,000 COVID-positive patients in their homes. Venus and Y Hospice is the largest hospice provider to veterans in the state. In 2020, we conducted 920 veteran patients admissions to our hospice service. Our hospice program is a level five We Honor Veterans program with the National Hospice and Palliative Care and, and Organization and the VA, which empowers hospice providers to meet the, the, the unique demands of, veter of dying veterans on end-of-life care. There are approximately 22 and a half million veterans in America today, 18 million of which are over the age of 65. It is becoming even more important to conduct this outreach so that they, so that they the veterans, know their full VA benefits, which many of them are unaware of, that can help cover critical home care and hosp hospice and long-term care services. I want to thank you, the City Council, especially the Committee on Veterans, for providing the first time funding to this important program in fiscal year 2021. With this support, we have expanded it into Brooklyn and other areas with our veteran liaison, Ms. Sung Yoon, who is a former, former female Army combat medic, to help engage and support the community-based organizations and community hospitals. Our diverse team brings years of experience from VA hospital sites and active duty sites, including Walter Reed Hospital, with, back, with backgrounds in military service, ethnic, military service, ethnicity, and gender, which helps bring, bring culturally competent care. This additional funding will help support staff resources with one, educate and improve New York City veterans across, access their VA benefits, two, expand partnerships with veterans hospitals and groups, and three, educate community-based organizations and providers, including veteran service organizations about veteran special needs at end of life. During COVID-19, uh, DVS and, and the Visitor Service of New York helped support 
a, a hospice patient who was in need of, of food, who had limited resources due to the impact of the pandemic, where we collaborated to help get uh, Meals on Wheels services. We believe, we believe that this collaboration can help in many ways, and we look forward to your support and, and continued relationship in the years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Peter Kempner. Time begins upon your unmuting. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Kempner, and I'm the legal director at Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VALS. Uh, at VALS, one of the things that I oversee is our Veterans Initiative. Uh, before the pandemic, our Veterans Initiative worked hand in hand with the VA hospital in Manhattan, where we ran a legal clinic. Uh, focused on the end of life needs of senior veterans. Uh, we work closely with the social work department in the palliative care unit. After the pandemic shut the VA hospital down to outside visitors, we shifted our services online. And the core work that we do is that we help senior veterans engage in end of life planning and planning for incapacity by providing them with last wills and testaments powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, and other advanced directives. Um, in, uh, as we look ahead uh, to the needs of New York City's veterans over the upcoming fiscal year, uh, there are many lessons to be learned from the pandemic year we're emerging from. And we must acknowledge the enormous challenges that face our city's veterans. And as a legal services provider, we focus on the needs that an attorney can make a difference in, in our city's veterans for. Um, and so I want to draw attention to three issues. One is the, 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 the pending eviction crisis uh, that so many New Yorkers face. Uh, the other is the need to ensure that veterans have access to benefits to which they're entitled. And, and the third is to make sure that all vulnerable veterans have the right plan in place in the event that they ever become incapacitated or pass away. Uh, it, 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 in January 2021, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs reported that more veterans had died from COVID-19 than from uh, the operations in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom combined. Uh, and so we know that so many veterans have been vulnerable uh, over the past year to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and for our clients, by engaging in effective life planning, uh, elderly and disabled veterans are much more likely to be able to stay in their homes, age in place, and live with dignity. A veteran who has executed a power of attorney empowers their caregivers to be able to seek government benefits to pay their rent, to sign leases, to apply for and recertify for housing subsidies, and to deal with any issues which may arise with their landlord or housing provider. Landlords and market forces are increasingly pushing long-term tenants from their homes. So taking action to stabilize housing for veterans is more urgent than ever. A study released just last week by the, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development showed that for the first time in a decade, veteran homelessness in the United States has increased. And that was actually done, that survey had been done before the outbreak of the COVID-19 crisis. I and we so. know that that so many veterans have been vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 and their housing has been put at risk. And so, uh, you know, what I would like to do is just applaud the city council for funding free legal services for our veteran community and urge the council to take the necessary steps to safeguard and even increase this funding in the upcoming fiscal year. Having access to free high quality veteran focused legal services will ensure a brighter and safer future for our city's veterans who have sacrificed so much for all of us. Thank you for your time and allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Ashton Stewart. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Chair Deutsch and members of the Committee on Veterans. Uh, my name is Ashton Stewart. I'm the manager of Sage Vets, Sage's statewide program for LGBT or lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender veterans. Support from the New York City Council has been crucial to our program, allowing us to engage with older LGBT veterans across the great city of New York and make a real difference for the lives of many. Um, SAGE was founded in 1978 and is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving lives of LGBT older people. And SAGE Vets is one of many programs at SAGE, but 
the only program in New York State that is ded dedicated to older LGBT veterans. Um, this program was created in 2014 to identify support and improve access to, and care to uh, older LGBT veterans across the state and in the city. And the, over the last year, we've had a lot of success. We've been able to continue the program working remotely. We made over 40 legal referrals with nine legal victories, including a discharge upgrade, approved disability claims, Restoration of Honor Act uh, was approved, preventing an eviction and a ruling by the New York State Supreme Court to change guardianship. Um, and this is all thanks to the legal programs that do exist to the pro bono veteran legal programs that we partner up with um, and work as a mediator between the veteran and these programs. So they're crucial to this ongoing work. Um, last year also, we were heard on Marketplace, a national broadcast heard by um, more than 20 million listeners each week. And we were also very honored to receive the 2020 uh, Black Veterans for Social Justice Gallantry Award. And we also nom nominated the very first uh, transgender veteran to the New York State Senate Veterans Hall of Fame, Brad Hoylman's district. Uh, she was inducted last May. And in the Restoration of Honor Act, the application that was success successful was for a 63-year-old Black cisgender gay male of the U.S. Navy who had perfect uh, performance evaluations, scored the highest possible score. He earned Sailor of the Month multiple times and was discharged for being gay. Um, he was awarded the Restoration of Honor Act. He had meritorious application thanks to uh, the work that the legal partners with us worked with us on. And his statement is he has an enormous admiration for the Navy, but not the policy that ended his career. Um, we're so delighted to have three more veterans in the pipeline to apply for the Restoration of Honor um, who are in similar situations. We were able to participate in a virtual Veterans Day parade. The city's got such determination, um, Mr. Deutsch, um, to, to continue our work and to continue to get the word out there about the great success that we've had thanks to the city council. Um, we really want to continue this work, obviously. Um, we know things are tight and we appreciate the support that we've had. Um, just to close, we had great success on the case for a, a Latina transgender uh, female veteran who lives in the Bronx, she submitted an MST claim. Um, was awarded back pay amounting to more than $20,000 and has an increase to 70% service-connected disability. And her life has changed. Um, she also has that, uh, that courage um, that's validated now because the VA has admitted that, yes, yeah, something that happened here to you was wrong, and we want to compensate you for that. So thank you so much for making such a tremendous difference in people's lives. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. I'll turn it back over to Chair Deutsch for any remarks or questions. Thank you, uh, Ashton. It's uh, really a pleasure to partner with you on, on these initiatives. And also, I just want to thank Peter and uh, Joe for their testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to our final panel, which will be Charlotte Martin and Gary Bagley. We'll now call on Charlotte Martin. Time begins. Hello. Uh, first off, thank you to the City Council Fund. Um, oops, sorry. First off, good afternoon, um, and thank you for holding today's hearing and advocating for veterans funding. My name is Charlotte Martin, and I'm the Senior Manager of Access Initiatives at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. In this capacity, I have the privilege of overseeing the museum's veterans access initiative that includes a range of programs and resources for current and former service members and their families. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge the generous financial and advisory support of the city council committee on veterans. I wanna thank chair Deutsch and the committee members and staff for your ongoing effort to connect veterans with one another and with cultural resources like the Intrepid Museum. At the Intrepid Museum, our mission is to promote the awareness and understanding of history, science, and service in order to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. Centered on a former Navy aircraft carrier, we have long engaged veterans through Veterans Day and Memorial Day events, Fleet Week activities, a robust volunteer program, and free admission for veterans. In the fall of 2015, we also launched free military family programs to connect um, to foster connections and started offering free tours uh, to a PTS peer support group at the Bronx VA. And we now offer free tours to any veterans organization. We soon expanded to offering intrepid after hours evening progr programs exclusively for current and former service members with behind the scenes opportunities, 
veteran-led creative workshops, catered dinner, and plenty of bonding across branches, service eras, and post-service experiences. Thanks to city council funding, we were able to schedule these programs more regularly, guarantee high quality catering for the all important bonding over meals and bring in veteran artists, performers and others. With funding, we also began to offer uh, special veteran plus programs, including film screenings, performances, a pride event, special partnerships, and now a book club with books provided for veterans and their loved ones, um, as well as vet video chats. We've benefited from staff trainings led by experts at the NYU Langone uh, Cohen Military Family Center and the New York Presbyterian Military Family Wellness Center. And from the advice and feedback of our standing council, uh, council of veteran advisors um, and other recipients of city funding, including DVS, Sage Vets, Jericho Project and others have been crucial partners and advocates for their constituents. When the museum closed due to the pandemic just over a year ago, we quickly pivoted to online programming in order to maintain a space for in connection with veterans. We collaborated with Waterwell on new Memorial Day programming and converted our planned Intrepid After Hours to a Zoom program. Recognizing the toll of isolation, we have since continued our online programming, maintaining connection with veterans through a difficult time, including with our Intrepid Book Club and a monthly On Liberty Zooming into Museum Across the Country program to create some semblance of travel and meeting new people. Our goal in all of this work is to foster community and connection among veterans, including those who are not connected or may not feel, or may feel excluded from other veteran spaces. The um, Veterans Community Development Initiative has been crucial to the growth and impact of the Intrepid Museum's programs for veterans and their loved ones. And we respectfully ask that the committee advocate for the continuation of the funds for this initiative, especially as we look ahead to reopening in just a couple of days and to gradually returning to in-person programming. So um, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. We will now call on our final witness. As a reminder, if we've inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. We will now hear from Gary Bagley. Time begins. Oh, uh, Gary, I believe you're still on mute. You have to accept the unmute. There we go. There you go. Time begins. Great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, Chair Deutsch and members of the City Council Committee on Veterans. I'm Gary Bagley from New York Cares. Uh, Mission VetCheck has been an incredibly important and wonderful collaboration between the New York City Department of Veterans Services, the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, and New York Cares. Our volunteers are being put to effective use, providing veterans with information about how to access vital public services, including free meals, COVID-19 test site locations, and mental health resources. Our specially trained volunteers call New York City veterans. They provide screening for essential services such as groceries or medication, and as important, provide a warm and caring voice. The program follows a script. The phone system's live tracking software allows volunteers to report any discovered needs in real time for fulfillment. In other words, if a volunteer connects with a client in crisis, the volunteer can connect the veteran in real time to a crisis management social worker. The program operates by a secure phone system, which allows fully background check volunteers and clients to connect without sharing personal contact information. Since June of 2020, New York Cares has made over 28,000 calls to clients through the work of 468 trained volunteers. Continuing to fund this type of programming enables many New York City veterans to benefit from a connection to their fellow New Yorkers. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, as one final reminder, if we have missed anyone that has registered to testify and has not been called on, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no hands, I will turn it back over to Chair Deutsch for closing the next. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so first, I want to thank uh, Charlotte and uh, Gary for testifying. And to Charlotte, we had a beautiful and meaningful uh, event at the Intrepid on uh, on Veterans Day. 
I mean, this was really uh, uh, a uh, really a meaningful meaningful event. Unfortunately, we all have um, you know due to COVID, we didn't have uh, we can only have a certain amount of people there. Uh, but um, I just want to say I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and my colleagues uh, for always standing up and making sure that the veterans um, initiatives uh, that we um, give to the to the um, not not community based organizations who do outstanding and amazing work. Um, last year we went through tough times and we were able to get the, uh, that funding. Um, after pushing it in the, during budget negotiations, and uh, this year we have the same um, same situation as last year. We'll do everything possible to make sure because this is crucial to the veterans community, and we need to keep on doing more, not less. So I'm confident, with the support of my colleagues, that uh, we're able to make sure that this funding is uh, is um, you know uh, reinstated. Um, so I think I'm done, uh, unless Commissioner Hendon is still on Zoom, I'm not sure. Did he raise his hand, Commissioner? Hey, I'm still on. Okay, can you? No, <laughs> got it. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. No, I... Um, you know, so now uh, folks from DHS got back to us and what we're being told is that social services law 131 uh, prevents us from disclosing, uh, you know, information of this nature in a, a public hearing. And so this is why we want to make sure we get back to you with what we can get on this. And another point, too, is that this was a count that was January 28th, 2020. And so what we believe, I'm talking internally, because the, the, the street homeless team for DHS, they make sure that those folks who have been identified receive the same kind of services they would receive were they in the shelter. And so what we believe is it's likely these folks have been housed since things. That's 14 months ago. So one of the questions we want to get back to you about is what support were those people offered and where are they right now? And so these are things we do. We recognize the point so it, it can you know get at the bottom of your questions. Um, but right now, unfortunately, can't release information at this time. Know that we're working this, so we want to be able to get you responses. But, you know, I've been told DHS that uh, yeah, Social Services Law 131 uh, prevents us from disclosing this type of client information in a public hearing, unfortunately. Okay. All right. So at least we lit the fire on DHS, right? Okay. So we'll follow up offline. Um, so I want to thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for all the great work that you do. And I want to thank your staff, your wonderful staff. And I want to thank the Veterans uh, Committee and um, uh, my citywide coordinator, Joe Bello. And to all those out there, all the advocates, um, thank you so much for all the work. And, and I'm speaking on behalf of the commission also. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do. And uh, what, um, so looking forward to, um, you know, the budgets and, uh, and, and getting the Veterans Initiatives reinstated with the help of my colleagues. So to everyone out there, uh, God bless the United States of America. God bless all our, vet our, our veterans and God bless you all. Um, the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.